Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, you're all very welcome. It's my privilege this afternoon to welcome um, Sinead Malloy, one of our COP members and participants on the um, Experiential Change Programme. And Sinead happens to be also one of our digital health managers in the community. And I'm also like to welcome Irene Maguire. Irene is one of our steering group members and a convener of one of our communities of practice. And Irene uh, has worked in many different roles and um, she's between jobs, I think, at the moment. But um, it's great to have Irene here with us. And I'd like to welcome Katrina Heslin, um, our Assistant National Director for Organization Development and Design, who is joining us to share her insights and who has been one of the sponsors of this program. And of course, to welcome back Helen Bevan. Helen, who joined us on our launch day on the 27th of January to share a lot of our knowledge, experience and evidence of her years of working in change and quality improvement. So with that, Helen, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Marie. And it's fantastic for me to be back with the community of practice members. I uh, really enjoyed being part of the launch um, in January. And um, yeah, I'm back by popular request. And my topic is also by popular request uh, because when members of the community of practice were asked what they'd like me to talk about, um, uh, you said we'd like you to talk about the, uh, the seven rules. So what I thought I'd do is to talk about the seven rules, uh, but do it in a way where I could bring some other themes in. So there's, a, there's some reinforcement of some of the key themes that I talked about in January, plus hopefully some new ideas. So our focus is around delivering change together and how when we come together, we can make change happen. And the particular aspect that I want to talk about is about how the actions that we take today as leaders and facilitators of change can create a different tomorrow. And um, this work, which is um, otherwise known as the seven rules, is based on a collaboration that I've had for more than a decade with Joran Henriks. And um, Joran is a leader of change for um, young shipping region in Sweden. And, you know, when I look around the world, um, young shipping is one of the places that I think shows us a way forward mm -hmm. in terms of, um, of health and social care mm -hmm. and, and, how, um, and how they work together. And I think whether you're in England like me or in Ireland, you know, we can all learn. Um, we can all learn from this this work. I'd like to show you a little bit of it. So, so everything I want to um, present to you now um, is based on uh, my collaboration with Joran. So if we could have the next slide. So, you know, when we think about the, the change that we're, we're facing, that in fact we're part of, what kind of system do we want for the future? This quote here comes from Paul Bertolden, who's one of the founding fathers um, uh, of, um, of uh, healthcare quality improvement. And he says, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So if as somebody who uses health, use health and care services, I don't get a good experience, you know, the care isn't joined up, I don't get a good experience, I don't get the outcomes that I, um, I would aspire to. It's because the system is actually designed that way. Mm -hmm. So if we want things to be different, then we have to design the system differently. What I've got here in the bottom uh, corner, uh, um, bottom right hand corner, is the it's the, the the health mantra of Young Shipping Region, and their aspiration, their mission is for people to have a good life in an attractive region. So it doesn't say you know people don't wait for care or we make good use of resources. They say actually our health mission is for everybody to have a, 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 a good life with health and in an attractive region. You know, we have a good life in a nice place. I think that's a brilliant um, health mantra. So if I could have the next slide. And one of the key things I think that we can learn um, from young shipping is, um, is how we think about um, what health means and how we support people to have health. And how can we continually improve the, the daily work that we do? And um, how can we invest in innovation? How can we learn? So if we wanna do these things, we need um, rather than lots of rules and processes and, uh, and procedures and boundaries, 
why can't we have some simple rules that unite people to think differently? And what we've got here is the young shipping approach. So, you know, the, the big emphasis is about how do we support people to be healthy um, in their daily life? And how do we put our resources and our effort into that? And in a situation where people are at risk or they have ill health, how can we um, how can we support people and help people to uh, rehabilitate, you know, to um, to get back to health in daily life? And only then do we actually start to think about the resources of the formal system. You know, we think about primary care and then right at the, um, the tip in the sense um, where we want to put the least focus uh, because we don't need it is so much is in is in um, in specialist care and this is the approach of um, of uh, young shipping at region so if i could have the next slide so you know um yeah what we need is a few simple rules to get us there so you know when you think about the kind of system changes that we face in england or in ireland if we want to get a very large group of people to behave differently with everybody moving in the same direction there are at least two different approaches that we can follow. And um, the first is about um, having uh, policies and procedures and uh, guidance um, and, and rules and uh, you know, approvals in a top-down cascade. So what we do in, in this approach is we say, yes, we have very clear uh, policies, we have standard operating procedures and operating systems, and we hold formal leaders in the system. So everybody's got a formal leadership role. We hold them and uh, we hold them um, to account. Another way of, um, of um, getting people to move in a, in a direction is to actually have some simple rules. And we align everybody through a set of simple rules that we all understand and we all buy into. And the thing about simple rules is that everyone in the system who has a role in the system is accountable for them. So actually, we all understand what the rules are and we can operate in conditions of much greater individual freedom. And I like this quote here from, from Michael Dobovic. And he says, a set of simple of several simple rules leads to complex, intelligent behavior. OK, that's what we see on um, on the right hand side here. And he says a set of complex rules where we are just constantly adding policies and procedures um, uh, can often lead to behavior that is dumb or primitive. And again, when you think about it, sometimes, for instance, um, certainly in, in my system in England, you know, where, you know, for instance, we have um, we have quality standards or targets for, um, you know, for 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 waiting time or for access, you know, those are done for a very with a very, very good intention. But but if we say that's what matters in the system, then then often, you know, people can end up gaming the, the system and we we stick to the target or the um, or the quality standard and we and we we miss the point. So um, so simple rules can be really powerful. And I just wanted to give you an example of this, if I could have the next slide. So um, this is Oldham. Oldham is a, um, a place, a locality in northern England. It's part of a bigger system called the Northern Care Alliance. And this was Oldham's COVID-19 approach. So rather than having you know, pages and pages of, um, of processes and procedures, they said, no, we've got five simple rules. OK, number one, keep current with the guidelines, either the national guidelines or our local um, Northern Care Alliance guidelines. Number two, defer to experts who know the science. Number three, coordinate, you know, and connect up through primary, secondary um, um, community, tertiary care. Um, don't confuse people. Um, number four, keep calm. And number five, stay kind. And uh, I think it's a pretty effective set of rules. Everybody understands them. We all move forward together. So if I could have the next slide. So Yaron and I have worked together for about 10 years to create these seven simple rules for leaders on the actions that we can take today to create a different tomorrow. And um, over that period, hundreds and hundreds of, um, of leaders of improvement and change from many different healthcare systems in different parts of the world have helped us um, with these. So I briefly want to take you um, take you through the seven. 
and then I'm going to um, to focus on um, on three of them. So number one, we'll come back to, which is about defining our shared purpose. Number two, we've talked about before and um, when I came to see you in January, but we'll come back to that one again about rooting our transformation efforts in a sense of belonging. Number three is predict and prevent, which is about starting an earlier stage um, in the care process or the intervention. And you could see that in the diagram that we saw from young shipping where you know and um, if we move upstream we support people in their activities of daily life um and so um we we need less of the um um the um interventions um uh downstream okay because because people are living healthier lives number four we'll come back to as well which is about supporting people to build their agency or or power um to make change happen at any level in the system Number five is when you're a leader working or a change agent working across you know, many different systems, we've got to embrace that there are contradictions and there are tensions and we just have to hold them. Okay. Number six is about unleashing learning as a power for transformation and about how we build learning into everything we do. And we know that, that a change or an improvement that might work in one context Okay. It might work in Galway, but will it work for people in Sligo? And we just don't know because our contexts are different. So we've got to be all learning in, you know, we've got to be experimenting. We've got to be trying things out in small ways. And number seven is about actioning small scale changes within a large scale framework. And, you know, what I'd say after three decades of, of leading change in the, in the National Health Service in England is, you know, change happens through small scale changes. It happens through um, through. Uh, tests and uh, and small scale experiments, trying trying things out. Okay, it's very important that we do things in a small scale way. But if all we've got is hundreds and hundreds of small scale changes, then that's what we've got: hundreds and hundreds of small scale changes. You know, a thousand flowers blooming, and they don't necessarily add up to to large scale change. So the real knack here is thinking about how we can build a large scale framework that we all understand that we do our small scale changes within. And, you know, some of the most um, effective large scale frameworks that I've seen have been simple rules. So I'm just very quickly going to take you through um, through three of these. So the first one is about defining our shared purpose. And if I could have the next slide. OK, we need to think about all three words, our shared purpose. And the next slide. So the first thing we need to think about is the our who are our people who are going to be impacted by the change? Who needs to be part of the change? And, and we need to get all those people on board. Secondly, the hour, those people are likely to be a very diverse group of people with different views and needs and expectations. So rather than focus on what divides us, OK, we need to think about, you know, what brings us together, what unites us. And then finally, we need to think about purpose. Why are we taking action? Why does it connect with the things that really matter to us? And again, you know, some of the things that you were you were talking about is how do we work together in different ways? You know, how do we bring um, uh, people from the community, people from primary care, um, um, people from secondary and tertiary care? You know, all working and um, all working together. And I'd say, as change leaders, we need to think about our shared purpose. And if I could have the next slide. I was going to show you a particular example of this. This comes from a campaign called hashtag end PJ paralysis, end pajama paralysis. And, um, and this was a campaign actually it swept uh, across the world. Um, uh, and it's people who, um, who um, or it was initiated by people that work in the system that actually are feeling quite upset because, you know, you've got um, older people in hospital beds or in care home beds who are, um, immobilized in beds and we know that somebody over the age of 80 that spends a week immobilized in a hospital bed um, their their muscles can age in uh, by um by 10 years so you know if we think about um uh, our shared purpose for this for this campaign called um end pj paralysis okay and um, let's have a look at that and, and i'm going to show you an example from one of the groups and just to say this campaign was incredible in england and um, in in across england um, it was all driven by people working at the the point of care and and the campaign saved up 710,000 hospital beds so let's look at our shared purpose for end pj paralysis so if we have the next slide so we start there with the hour 
and uh, and and again there's lots of people that we need to involve you know patients need to be part of the hour nurses physios doctors students families senior leaders care assistants all need to be part of this and then shared you know what unites us actually what unites us all is anger and outrage at older patients deteriorating when it's in our power to do something about it by getting people um, mobilized earlier so and then finally what's our purpose well it's to make sure that every person in the hospital bed gets mobilized when they are ready both clinically and personally and that every person gets choice and a chance for the future life they want and and in this situation here with mainly older people it's about getting the chance to go back and live independently in in their own homes rather than having to go um you know into um into um, a sector with um, with more support so when you're thinking about your projects you know you're working across sectors think about our shared purpose so if i could have the next slide and um, the next um topic is about um is about building a sense of belonging we talked about this in january and i just wanted to reinforce it because again you know when we're working together as teams across um sectors um, building a sense of our shared purpose. A core part of that is about how we build a sense of belonging. And again, why I wanted to reinforce this, if I could have the next slide, is because research shows us, um, um, you know, how important this is. Um, you know, when we talk about people at work, someone belongs when they're seen for the unique things that they bring, when they feel connected to their co-workers, when they feel supported in their daily work, uh, supported in their career development, proud of their organization's values and purposes. So, you know, when you're working together in a hospital based team, um, uh, it's easier to do that. But when we're bringing together people from from many different um, sectors and experiences, it's so important that we're building that sense of belonging. And if I could have the next um, slide again, um, you know, thinking about about some of the um, the research um, on this. What it shows us is that building a sense of belonging is one of the most critical tasks in leading change. And this is um, research from Deborah Rowland um, from London School of Economics and, um, and, um, and one of her co-contributors. And she says, our most recent research into successful leadership of large scale complex change shows a vital ingredient that's omnipresent always present in all human systems, our fundamental need to belong, to feel secure, included, and part of something significant. If you feel you belong, loyalty follows, and with that, the permission for risk-taking and innovation. So if we as change leaders want to create the conditions where, um, where people can you know, really feel um, um, able to... Um, uh, to make change happen or suggest new things you know it's up to us as leaders of change and um, to build that sense of belonging and the final one of the the seven simple rules that I wanted to focus on today is about supporting people to build their agency or or power and we're talking about everybody in the system at lots of different levels because we understand that you know when we say yes we want people to have the power for change we understand that somebody who's a service user or a student has actually got a lot less power for change than somebody that's a senior leader if i could have the next slide so what we know is that change efforts are far more likely to succeed because people have got a sense of that they've got agency for change. And how we would define agency is the sense of power, permission, and safety to make change happen. So all of us who are um, either facilitators of change or leaders of teams, it's one of our big jobs, okay, to, to, to um, support people to, to feel that they've got this sense of agency. And again, what the research shows us is people having a sense of agency is more important when it comes to successful change than having improvement skills or having money or resources to make the change happen or having a good methodology. Actually, people feeling they've got the, the, the power and the support to make change happen is, is so important. And if I can have the next slide. And we saw this in January, but again, I wanted to just reinforce this. And this is the hierarchy of capabilities. It comes from a book called Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them, written by Gary Hamill and Michelle Zanini in 2020. It was one of the top selling leadership books of 2020. And what they basically say is what we've got here is a, is a hierarchy, if you like, a pyramid of capabilities. 
And the higher up we go, the more we maximize the contribution that people can make. And if we look at the capabilities in the bottom half of the um, uh, of the um, pyramid, what we see is obedience. You know, as leaders, we can expect people to follow the rules and stick to the guidance. We have got diligence. You know, we can expect people to turn up at work when they're meant to and to do um, to put effort into work. And we can expect people to have expertise. So we can expect people to have the skills for the job or be willing to learn the skills for the job. And all those cap capabilities in the bottom half of the triangles triangle are all things that we as formal leaders in the system can expect and command people. But let's look at those capabilities in the top half of the pyramid. These aren't capabilities that we can command. People have got to want to do these. Okay. It's about you know initiative. And um, again, if we are trying to create big changes uh, across our, our system, we want people to take initiative and to try new things. We need people to be creative with you know ideas for doing things differently. And then right at the top of the pyramid, we have daring, which is about you know being having the courage to try new things and um, being willing to take a risk. And we know that if people don't feel they have agency, then they won't have the initiative, the creative, the creativity, at creativity, and most um, uh, importantly, the willingness to take risk and to to do things differently. And if I could have the next slide. And when we talk about agency, we're not just talking about agency for people who work in the system. We're also talking about agency for people who use the system because we want every single person um, who uses our health and care systems to, to have a sense of, of agency about their own health. And I just finally wanted to show you this example from Young Shipping to show that we're never too young to build our agency. And what this is about is that um, children, very young children, as young as three, um, who are using the, the um, health services in, um, in Yongshiping, the, um, the, the staff in Yongshiping have, um, have um, built a system whereby any child coming in um, for uh, an appointment, before the appointment begins, they actually choose the order in which they want things to, um, to happen in their appointment. If I could have the next slide. And, and so what happens to them in the appointment will happen in the order the child wants it. And one of the things that's been really interesting about this was that clinical staff always used to, to leave um, injections um, um, or blood taking right to the end. And, um, and actually what the children say almost consistently is, no, we want that first. So, um, so yeah, we're, um, we should all be supporting people to build their agency and we're never too young to have agency. So if I could have the final slide. So when you're thinking about your, um, your change efforts and um, the different tomorrow that you're creating for people who use health services in Ireland, think about how we define our shared purpose, building a sense of belonging, um, uh, predicting and moving our thinking upstream, how we support people to build their agency, you know, building um, contradictions and tensions, holding them, not trying to solve them, unleashing learning as a power for change, and finally, um, building our small changes within a bigger framework. And um, I'll end it there.